Hi, it's George here. Uh, what I want to do in this video is just show you some different types of endotracheal tubes. Now you might have heard me mention over the course of some videos uh, referring to an evac tube or something like that. But what I would like to do in this video is just show you some different types of endotracheal tubes that you may encounter as your may encounter in your professional career as a physician or as a respiratory therapist, nurse, uh, EMT, paramedic, etc. So I want to start off with your, your basic endotracheal tube. And that's a tube that looks something like this. Whoa, this is a big one. This is a size 9, but it's a typical conventional endotracheal tube. Patient adapter end right over here. Distal end, Murphy's eye, a little hole at the end there. You've got your cuff right over here. So nothing much to it. Cuff, pilot balloon line, and, and pilot balloon. Gets inserted into your patient, not much to it. Now a variation of your endotracheal tube, your basic endotracheal tube, is called an evac tube. And this is an evac tube, what an evac tube looks like. Pretty much looks the exact same, right? Patient adapter end here, distal end, Murphy eye, the hole at the tip here. Your cuff, it's a tapered cuff. But what this evac tube has on it, besides the pilot balloon line and pilot balloon, it's got this extra catheter right over here. You can kind of see this extra catheter here, kind of follows the posterior portion of the tube. And it's part of the design of the tube. So this catheter is called an evac catheter, right? Like an evacuation catheter. And what it does is it runs the full length of the endotracheal tube all the way down to this little hole. I'm not sure if you can see it on the video, but there's a little hole right here that sits simply uh, on top of the cuff or proximal to the cuff, but it's on the bottom of the tube. So when this tube's inside your patient's airway, inside their trachea, that little hole is going to be sitting inside their trachea just beyond the vocal cords and above the cuff, so that any secretions that form above the cuff, they can be aspirated out or suctioned out with the evac catheter hooked up to suction. Now, since it's in the trachea, if you're doing PRN suctioning of the evac tube or the evac catheter, you'd want to have your suction level set to minus 120 millimeters of mercury. However, what we do in this area is we like to run our catheters hooked up to suction, and we run that suction at minus, well, roughly about minus 30 millimeters of mercury. Anywhere in between that minus 25 to minus 40 range, but we can tend to run around minus 30 cent uh, millimeters of mercury negative pressure. So we're constantly sucking the gas out, or sucking the gas, well, not necessarily gas, but sucking the secretions out that are located above the cuff when the tube is inserted into your patient's trachea. Now, it will remove some gas, but it shouldn't be removing gas from the trachea. It'll be removing gas from the upper airway. So it's a way of getting rid of secretions that are sitting above the cuff when this tube is in use. Okay? So that's your evac tube. The next tube I want to show you, and there's a couple of variations to this particular tube. They're called the um, Ray tubes, which stands for Ring Adair Elwin, which are the physicians that designed it. And there's two types. There's an oral ray and a nasal ray. This is an uncuffed oral ray. And you can kind of see it's got this pre-bend right over here. This pre-bend means, well, the tube's going to be inserted into the patient's oral cavity and into the patient's trachea. The bend prevents it from being inserted too far. But it's this type of tube, even though it's called an oral ray, it's inserted orally, but it's primarily for nasal-related, nasopharyngeal surgeries. The nasal ray looks something like this, right? So this nasal ray tube is a cuff nasal ray tube, and you see it's got a bend in it as well. This is inserted nasally for nasal intubations when they're going to be performing oral types of surgeries. Surgeries in the oral cavity leading to the oral pharynx. So a nasal ray is nasally inserted, but for oral pharyngeal type surgeries. Also have another tube right over here. This is called a nasal gastric tube. This is not an airway for intubation, it's just simply a nasal gastric tube. But it's not an airway that we would use to uh, intubate our patients with, so let's get rid of it. Next one I want to show you is called an endotrol. And the endotrol is simply a tube, and there's variations of this because there's different manufacturers. It's got a ring on it. And this ring right over here is attached to the distal end. So that when this tube's inserted, if you pull on this ring, watch what happens. Right? So I pull on the ring, okay? that distal end moves. So what that means is if you're inserting this nasally, like for a blind intubation, or orally, you can advance the tube, and as you're advancing the tube, you can pull on the ring to make the tube go more anterior so you have a better chance of hitting the patient's trachea. So really good with nasal intubations, but it can be used for oral intubations as well because you can 
adjust the distal position of that tube and hopefully have better success reaching that patient's trachea. Another tube we have right over here, this is called the reinforced tube, also called the armor tube or the spiral wire type tube. Again, your typical tube, patient adapter end, distal end, Murphy's eye, there's your cuff, it's a flat or tight to shaft cuff. It's a very pliable tube, pilot balloon line, pilot balloon. It's very pliable, like I said, like it just it moves around. It can just do a lot of different things with it. So it is quite a cool tube, can tie it in a knot even. Now this tube, type of tube is used when you have to have your patient in extreme head positionings because you can conform your tube like this, make it look like a pretzel. Now you wouldn't do it clinically, but you can make it look like a pretzel and the tube doesn't kink off. So any type of surgery that requires it, any kind of, uh, or any type of intubation that requires extreme head positions or different head positions, the tube, kind of like a slinky, it doesn't kink. That's a big benefit of this tube, all right? So reinforced spiral wire tube prevents kinking. A couple other things, we've got an endocath or a dual lumen endotracheal tube. It's simply an endotracheal tube that has two lumens to it. So you've got a bronchial tube and a, a tracheal tube. So one uh, would ventilate below the cuff that's sitting in the trachea to independently ventilate one lung versus the bronchial cuff, which sits in one of the main stem bronchi. So you can have independent lung ventilation with a dual lumen tube like this. We also have something called an endobronchial blocker. Looks like a regular endotracheal tube with one difference. It's got this extra sheath right over here. So when this tube's positioned properly, under bronchoscopic observation, you could advance this distal portion, this distal catheter, inflate it with gas and plug off one particular um, uh, bronchi inside the patient's lung, like a lobar bronchi or a segmental bronchi, if you could wedge it in that far, right? So you can occlude one area of the lung for specific lung surgeries. It's an endobronchial blocker, different than the dual lumen or endocath. And the last tube I want to show you is the donut endotracheal tube right over here. Well, it's actually not really an endotracheal tube. It's a standard endotracheal tube that somebody broke the pilot balloon line off and they conformed it into the shape of a donut. Duh, it's not really an endotracheal tube for use, but just checking to see if you're still awake at the end of the video. Anyways, those are some of the endotracheal tubes you might come into contact with when you're um, inserting the airway, know how it goes in. When you're maintaining the airway, know how to properly maintain that airway when it's in place. And also when it's time to extubate the patient, know how to properly suction your patient and how to properly and safely remove the tube from your patient as well. This has been George. We had a, I hope this was informative for you. If you have any questions, please let me know. If you have any comments, hit the like button if you liked it. Let me know if you didn't like and how ways I can make it better. And if you get a chance, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Hope you have a good day.